I remember hearing that word. You know what? All this time later, seven plus years, I'm reporting on that word and, and what it does inside of me. I remember hearing it and actually repeating it and saying, what does deceased even mean? I remember actually going into denial, completely convincing myself that what I just heard wasn't true. My name is Matthew Mayer. I am the president of Soldiers for Faith Ministries. I grew up in Cape May Courthouse, New Jersey, the southern tip, close by to the beach, born and raised in a very strong Christian household. My mother and father uh, taught me and my older brothers faith by living faith. That's, what I, that's how I learned it. I watched them actually live it. Soccer was my main sport growing up. I played basketball, played football, um, but as I got older, I started to narrow out the, the sports path, and soccer was what I really excelled at. March, April of 2007, um, when I got to college, I went down and trained with a professional organization in North Carolina. My older brother was on that exact team, impressed the coach so much he signed me within the week. So I signed my pro first professional contract on the exact same team as my older brother. So. My parents were super proud. Their youngest boy and another one of their sons was playing professional soccer together. My first start as a rookie was against international powerhouse Cruz Azul of Mexico. So to be on that field was super surreal. I remember it like it was yesterday, putting on the jersey, my name, my number, having you know a packed house in a stadium and getting called out as the starting lineup and then playing pretty well that game. And that was kind of my lifestyle out of college. On a March 1st, 2009 Sunday game professionally, I tore my ACL and my meniscus, two ligaments in my knee, a routine turn on the turf, turned out, popped my entire knee. And that was uh, essentially, to many, a career-ending injury. It's very hard to recover at that level from an ACL or knee injury. I had a very unique routine with my older brother. He's married at this time. I lived with him when I was in North Carolina playing pro, and his wife would actually cook us this nice meal the day before a game, and this was the night before a game. The team was traveling to Baltimore, Maryland for a Saturday game, and I couldn't play because I was already on the injured reserve list. My surgery for my knee repair was already scheduled the following week, so I remember just being in a vulnerable place. So I decided to go out, and I left my apartment on City Ave in Philadelphia with no plan. As the night unfolded, I think that was where the danger really set in, having no plan. The, the saying is when you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And as we went over to the bar, I was with a group of about 10 people. The bartender came over and he knew who my brother Anthony was from his soccer days. And he said, I'm sorry to hear about your knee. And he brought up the knee injury. And I remember just being like, ah, oh, it's all good, man. And he put out shots for my group. And I remember not even telling my group that there was drinks for them, and I took about five drinks in a row of these shots, and I rated it boom, boom, boom. And it was from that point forward, really, where obviously my inhibitions were thrown out the window, my judgment, uh, everything was skewed, and the bar establishment closed, the lights went on, and me and my one good friend decided to continue the night. I got into my vehicle, turned it on, and we, instead of going a mile down the street or even walking, we decided to go to Atlantic City. Got onto Atlantic City Expressway, uh, 20 miles outside of Philadelphia, made it to about mile post 18 on Atlantic City Expressway. And as it turned into a four lane highway, I remember speeding up, going past 85, entering into 90 miles per hour. And as I'm passing a vehicle in one of the lanes, kind of blindly looked over my shoulder like this out the window, and got back into the lane that I was coming out of and another vehicle was merging into that lane and my front right struck his back left, which resulted in this motor vehicle collision and his vehicle spinning out because of the way I struck him. Felt like we were in a whirlwind that lasted only a few seconds, spinning out of control. We hit up against something and then the vehicle came rest.
They took me through some field sobriety tests. Now I'm in custody in the back of a state police vehicle. I'm taken to their local barracks. I'm given a breathalyzer test. They run that a few times. They eventually put me in a holding cell. And now in the holding cell, I remember sitting down and then I overheard a conversation. And the conversation took place outside of the cell, could not see it, but I could hear it and it was the dispatch center. And through a muffled radio sound, as I'm sitting there, this is exactly what I heard and I will never forget it. They said, accident on Atlantic City Expressway is currently being cleaned up. And I remember listening. They said, driver in the black Escalade. Is in custody. So I remember listening, and then they said the driver in the town and country is deceased. As you can imagine, a court scene, they got to share from their perspective. The prosecutor got to say his piece. People spoke on my behalf. One of the most beautiful presentations came from one of his daughters, and she told us about her daddy, and she gave us his resume and, and how he grew up and where he came from and how he was a hard worker and he was a good father. And, and she basically turned and said, we've heard nothing but good things about Mr. Mayor here. And she went and continued talking about her daddy. It was so beautiful, and everybody needed to hear that, and I needed to hear that. And then his oldest son got up, and his name was Noon. And Noon got up, and he threw off that vibe. He threw off what his sister had said, and he starts to yell, Do you have any idea how I heard about my daddy dying? And he's pointing at me. And he took the court through this emotional roller coaster about this phone call that he received, about hearing his daddy's dead and he's yelling, and rightfully so, with anguish and pain. He's directing it all to me, and, and I was the, the, the object that caused all this. And as I'm looking at him and I'm, I'm staring him in the eye to give him the respect he deserves, regardless of what he was saying to me, and the final thing he said was, and you destroyed my world. And about three seconds went by, and you could hear the entire court whimper and his next step his next move his next word after a three second pause was but i forgive you my brother and he came over to where i was sitting down at the bench and the bailiff told me to rise and i stood up and he came over and we embraced each other like brothers and i whimpered in his ear and i said i am so sorry i am so sorry and it felt as if in that moment, January 7, 2010, the day I would be sentenced to prison was the exact day that I was set free forever. The Bible says, if you are confessing what you've done against God, he's faithful, he is just, he will forgive you. And I believed early on that I was forgiven by him and I forgave myself. And I knew that any type of uh, bitterness against myself, against my circumstances, any type of resentment, anger, guilt, shame would prevent me from responding with accountability and integrity to honor my victim's family, to honor Mr. Hort Cap and his memory. I knew that, I knew that early on that for me to honor him and honor God, is to push through my own selfishness, my own pain, my own misery, my own sorrow. And I believed that God had forgiven me. And as I got deeper into the story, even pre-prison, and I was able to share, uh, the more healing came to my own heart. And obviously the catalyst of that full healing was heaven reaching down on sentencing day through Mr. Hort Cap's son, Noon, and extending forgiveness. That was like the sealer to me going away to prison, set free, but on a mission and a journey to magnify God in everything I said and everything I did. So it was like it snapped on 
and it was no longer intellectual, it was no longer head knowledge. It now fell from my head into my heart and I felt it. And it, the pain that I have inside of me, God's turned into passion. So I, I refuse to allow pain to debilitate the voice that God has entrusted to me. No matter where I find myself speaking on any type of circuit in colleges and schools and um, different venues and events, I want to make sure I always highlight God's forgiveness. And regardless of where you've been and regardless of what you've done, the moment you turn back to Him, He receives you, He forgives you, and He's willing to use you in spite of you. So there's the message. And my prayer is that people hear that. And no matter where they've come from, if they can come back and realize there's a hope, and the hope is found in Jesus.